right? On policy, government needs to one, put agriculture back into the system, into the school system. How do we do this? Kids from kindergarten should know what measures, what crop is it for um, pineapple. See, I was recently in a program at World Food Forum in Rome, a place that do not even grow much in terms of pineapple and things like that. They were teaching kids, this is how pineapple looks like. This is our pineapple stem. They brought the whole pineapple. So put agriculture back into the school system. Let agriculture be, it's, it should be a core subject that every student from kindergarten straight up to university must pass through. One of the few things that, one, we've taken agriculture out of our curriculum. So the kid that is coming out does not know the basic needs of agriculture. He doesn't even know how his food is grown. Yes, let me tell you something interesting. Three days ago, my wife sent me a picture of a harvest that they have done at the back of our house. And guess what? It was plantain. They harvested plantain. And they have, I don't know the English word, but I would say they have like a bundle of them. Let's say three of them. And I told her that, please keep one for me. When I get back to Ghana, this is what I'm going to eat. And then she said, please, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. By the way, that is in Ghana, and that is what is happening. I remember back in junior high school, there was a subject called uh, life skills. With life skills, we were learning a lot, you know, planting, we were learning how to sew. We were doing a lot of skilled uh, projects back in school, but it got to a time they took it off. You know, they changed the whole syllabus, the whole content. And even now, uh, we are still looking at getting a content that will suit the people of Ghana, that will suit the economy of Ghana, you know, the social life of Ghana. Today, I am very happy that you're joining me to have a discussion with the brother who is out there doing something in agriculture. Yes, uh, uh, big ups to everybody who has been watching some of my videos where I went to, I remember one of my videos, I went to a farm with some of my students and then we were, you know, plowing, trying to plant uh, pepper, tomatoes and all these things. And at the end of the day, we harvest them, we sell them and then we use the money to run the school. Sometimes we even prepare a meal for the whole school, which was really, really beautiful. Like I said, it is time for Africans to eat what they grow and grow what they eat. So today, I'm very honored to bring on board a brother who is from Ghana, but currently out there doing massively in terms of agriculture. So with that honor, I want to introduce to you my brother, Chairman. Brothers. What's your name? I'm not I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But I'm not sure. 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 Now, um, let's go straight to the point. Um, sure. What would you say is the status of agriculture when it comes to Ghana? Good. Um, thank you so much, uh, Merko. The status of agriculture when it comes to Ghana and that of Africa is bad. Bad in the sense that um, we not we are not yet to we are not being able to feed ourselves. We are importing basic things that we need not to import. Basic food items, and I will tell you a story today. My whole agricultural destiny started from Cape Coast, and I'll give credit to Sambridge Hotel. Mr. Forson of Blessed Memory, you and I know him. The owner of Sambridge Hotel asked me to run the business. And we, we started. And then I happened to go to Kotokrava Market with a chef. And on the market is when my agricultural eye opened that day. I remember it was a Wednesday. And that's the days that you normally go to the market. So we go to the market. Normally, sometimes go to market. Yes. We go to Kotokrava this time around. I was waiting for them in the car. Normally, they keep long. I entered and said, let's get guys, do it quickly, let's go. So I got to argue with the vendor, the market woman, about the cost of onions. Asked me. And then on the point of the argument was like, I was like, ah, these things are coming from around here. Why is this so expensive? He said, no, because we import it. I said, what? We import it from where? Just, just still doing my TikTok chat. I said, madam, this is coming from Nigeria and Niger. Stop this thing that. He said, go and check, go check label. And then you know your typical fancies. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I said, go check label. No, I can't remember the ketchup. 
to wait. He said, go and check the label on the sack and come and tell me where this thing is coming from. So I went to check the label. To my surprise, we were importing onions. That or onions with the orange flesh, quite we are white. We importing mm-hmm. that onions is coming from Netherlands. We importing potatoes. I I took the liberty to check that time. We're importing potatoes, Irish potato from France, carrots from Belgium. If you go to the market now, Porto Cabo market, you see some carrots that are in um, in a in a polythene bag. Mm-hmm. Those big ones, they are coming from Belgium. So our state of agriculture to date, and this is 2014, 10 years now, we're still facing similar issues. So our state of agriculture is not, it's not there. We are not there. Well, the state of agriculture is not there because uh, 10 years ago, like you're saying, from the labeled uh, sack and then speaking to the market woman, you realize that some of these things were imported. In your opinion, Ghana, everybody says Africa is blessed. And I would say that uh, full of resources, talk about the mineral you know, resources, we can have the gold diamond. Now back to the land, the agriculture, the greenery. What is making Africa or Ghana not able to produce the things that we need to produce for the people in Ghana and Africa to consume? If somebody say Africa is blessed or Ghana is blessed, it's an understatement. We are super blessed. We are blessed beyond imagination. One, our lands, very fertile lands. So it, for me, it was anger from the marketplace that took me to go into agriculture, to start the whole agricultural revolution. So we started Farmers Apprentice and then brought down to where we are now today. So. And I've driven across Africa. The, the nature of my work has taken me to Zimbabwe, Zambia, Kenya, um, and I'm now based more even in Nigeria than Ghana. Between Nigeria and Ghana, of late, I've been driving from Abuja to Accra, and it's for a purpose. The purpose is now the pandemic. What do we? You see, when you drive, currently I'm, I'm on a trip in Europe. And going in Europe, you know, I do more of train than um, flight. So train, I've done train, I've done bus. I've done about six countries now, all on bus and train. You get to appreciate the landscape. If you fly, you don't see anything. So what do you say we are blessed? We are super blessed. Good land, a lot of water resources, perfect weather for agriculture. Super perfect weather for agriculture and a lot of human capital. But aside all these things, our major headache is the right policies that will make agriculture better and our food systems much, much more better. Mm-hmm. So yes, we are blessed. The land is there. The people are there. The water resources that we need to... Let me give you an example. Water leak from the Akosomo Dam in Ghana, that's water that comes down from the water lake through sugar copper down to the estuary in the sea. It's almost about four, it's about 40 million liters every day. That is the kind of water we allow into the sea. This is the water that should have been used for irrigation purposes. Mm-hmm. And yet, water comes out, we use it to generate to generate electricity. After that, we allow it into the sea. Then we'll go back and say we want to build Kita Sea Defense. So we are blessed, but we've not been able to channel the people's energy in the right way that will make it more useful for us to benefit from agriculture. Has agriculture been accepted by the people of Cape Coast or no, the people of Ghana or Africa? I am talking, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, a large number of people. I'm talking about the typical layman individual walking around Ghana right now. How do you, as someone who is an expert in agriculture, how do you see such a person? Do you think the local person is ready to say that, hey, I want to, okay, try and grow something. I want to go into uh, 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 either fish farming, animal rearing. Like, what is it with the typical African man when it comes to agriculture? The typical African man has agriculture at the bedrock. See, across Africa, every man knows that uh, Saturdays is for farming. Um, mostly, 
everybody knows Saturday is for farming because one growing up, it is Saturday that our parents took us to farm because Monday to Friday we are going to school. But the fundamental is that we've got the fundamental wrong. How do I say that? To date, we have removed, I'm, I'm speaking of Ghana and Nigeria. I can give you this as a typical example. We have taken out agricultural skills or practical agricultural lesson from our school curriculum. Let me, let me throw you back a bit. I think 15, 20, 25 years ago, maximum, when you and I were in primary school and GSS, we used to have agriculture on campus. You used to have school farms. So you have your bed whereby you are, you, it's your duty to maybe even arrange those flowers, make sure that you take the weeds out of all those flowers and cook. Fast forward it now. We are studying things that are not, that are not practical to our environment. You see, one of the few things that, one, we've taken a great out of our curriculum. So the kid that is coming out does not know the basic needs of agriculture. He doesn't even know how his food is grown. I can bet you authority that a lot of our people have, they don't know how rice is grown. Oh, who rice? We green, it's money mind rice, or a polished white, another brown rice. The local person understands and knows this, that, I mean, if you take anybody of our age, you appreciate and knows agriculture because agriculture affects everybody. You eat. You eat before you start thinking about your clothes. You eat before you start thinking about, I need to go to work. Even if you are at work, it's the food that gives you the energy. So we have not really done much when it comes to that sense. Every local person understands and appreciates agri. But the question is that, have we harnessed that knowledge to now put a person in the way that he will be put his hands into agriculture? We look at agri as a dirty work. Hmm. If you look at the typical image of a farmer in Africa, it's somebody who is wearing a hatted clothes, old lady who has a baby behind her back and carrying firewood. How would this appeal to today's young Gen Z who is using an iPhone 14, iPhone 15, mm -hmm. iPhone 10, or is using a Samsung Galaxy Flip or things? What will make this person want to go into agri? Nothing, nothing will make them go into agri. Unless we put our mind back to say, you know what, this is what fits us. The cost of meals keep going up. You and I, let me use our main, main, main bank. That's all about the cost of the day. It is because we are not, we are not even growing enough grains to feed our basic needs. So the old person who is on the street appreciates the contributions of farming or agri, but it's looking for how do I even get involved? Well, so that's where we are. Good. That is where we are. You made mention of a certain point, and I want to add up and say that I believe that the marketing team of Ghana or Africa or Nigeria that is supposed to market agriculture to interest young people like us, we are not doing it. You mentioned that in our, in our eyes, we see agriculture or we see a, someone who is into feminists and an old lady with a baby at the back yep. or an older person. I want to add that another thing we also see is only for the people in the villages. So since I am not in the village, I cannot be a farmer. So I think that the marketing side of agriculture to Ghana or to Ghanaians or Africans we are not hitting it there. What do you think about that? The marketing strategies. So it's all about it's all it's all it's all about image. What image have we put out there for agri? We have not done anything better. See, it years ago. I mean, when I started this whole revolution of agri, I was going to farms and I was um, showing pictures and doing videos. Especially, I was doing Facebook. I still do today. Showing pictures, and that's what got me the name Swag Farmer. I said I'm making farming sexy. <laughs> so um, it is what appeals to you that you get. If you are using, and I'm still going to use iPhone. I mean, using the iPhones and then iPad and computer, um, laptop. It is what it's been marketed. How it is marketed that attracts the person. For me to buy something, I know that this thing is appealing. It is um, working good enough for me. That is what will always make me to buy. Otherwise, I will not go to. Is it serving the purpose? 
So we've not marketed our agrit yet. We have not actually, um, the whole issue of agriculture, we've not taken it as a serious business. The only way to market to a youth or anybody is that to show the person that is going to make money. Simple. If we will not be able to prove to anybody that agri could make money. Nobody will go into agri. So the easiest way of making marketing it, making it known, is to be able to show the tangibles that this thing is going to make money. If not, we will not get it. See, what we are, I mean, it's no, it's recently that people are realizing that after all, bankers do not make that much money. You and I know years back that everybody wants to be a banker. Everybody wants yeah. to put on time. Even now, it is now that people are people, and I can give, I'm, I'm glad for what you are doing, Nicole. You're actually educating a lot of people. Thank it's you. now people are even knowing that I can even go into content creation and make money. Mm-hmm. That is why you now see a lot of people jumping and doing TikTok this, TikTok that. So once people know that this is going to make money, they are going to earn a decent job, decent area of unemployment, decent uh, money-making venture. They will automatically go into it. But you see, the difficulties with relating to agriculture in the government needs to do more mm-hmm. because starting up agribusiness ventures across Africa is crazy because there are no supporting systems. Typical example, we'll still go back to Cape Coast because you are now in mm-hmm. Cape Coast. Yeah. Let, me use a, let me use my old school, Ghana National. If I want to do a one acre or for five acres of maize cultivation on Ghana National campus, it's a forest zone. I need bulldozers to pull down trees, prepare the land a bit or develop the land before even tractor will come in. This, you're not going to make that amount of money within that first season mm-hmm. to be able to even recoup your investment in land preparation. So yeah. the fact is, I've not been able to, uh, the startup capital is not there, the enabling environment is not there, government do not pay anything like subsidy or anything. So late, Western world still pays subsidies to their farmers. You expect me to go and buy this at the same rate that the guy is putting it in his green wagon, mm-hmm. to go and put it in the tractor to come and till my land and now come and sell the crops to you at a cheaper price. It's not going to cut it. So those are the things. The basic thing that we need to do as a continent, as a continent, we've not done it. And this is continent-wide. Across the continent, the only countries that I think they seem they are doing well in agri. Kenya is one. Mm-hmm. Southern Africa is actually doing well. And it's because, and this is this is nothing, we shouldn't be sentimental about it or emotional. Oh, yeah. It is because the colonial masters did not make a way of living that, that side of town. So they developed the agriculture to their taste. So in Zimbabwe, you will see the large tracts of land, commercial properly prepared land. In Zambia, you will see same. In South Africa, it's massive. I mean, a drive from Joburg to Deban, you will see beautiful farm installations. When it comes to the Western Africa, because we're using minute land, so this one has one pole. We call it one pole, which is less than a One pole here, one pole there, small, small fragments. And we have if you drive along a crack clip coast, you get to a point in between that you see that bush. You will not find that when you drive, you take a train along Deban to Jobek, from Jobek to Deban, a, a bus ride. Or even you're doing a bus ride from, I recently did a bus ride from Rome to Spelling. Yes. You see lovely farm installation. It makes farming even really sexy and appealing. <laughs> so we've lost it. Until we go back to that side and say, we want to make sure that we put our people's mind. And it's a conscious effort that government needs to do. Government shouldn't think that everything is about making profit. You are taxing fertilizers. You are taxing agricultural machines. You are taxing basic inputs that are coming in for agriculture. Yet you are telling the farmer to sell it to a cheaper price. Come on, that is not possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So those are the things that we've lost. It. So there are a few things that we need to do. But on policy, government needs to one, put agriculture back into the system, into the school system. How do we do this? Kids from kindergarten should know what maize is, what crop is it for um, pineapple. See, I was recently in a program at World Food Forum in Rome, a place that do not even grow much in terms of pineapple and things like that. They were teaching kids, this is how pineapple looks like. This is how pineapple stem. They brought the whole pineapple. So put agriculture back into the school system. Let agriculture be 
it's it should be a core subject that every student from kindergarten straight up to university must pass through. Because with that, when he goes home and there's a pot of flowers, he will not use it as a flower. He will actually going to put a corn there or you put pepper there. So you will now come back to home gardening. And that's it, because what he has learned from school, he wants to practice it. An example is our children when they go back and they will do we wish to use these containers to when we're kids, we want to use these containers to see what you see. You are cooking, we are cooking mm -hmm. sand and those things. Mm -hmm. It is practical of what they see. So put the same system into the agriculture whereby they will go. Make enabling environment for youth to go through agriculture. Every secondary school, especially boarding houses, must have a great, must have school farm. And these are three ways, two ways to do it, not three, actually. Crop and livestock. Let me give you an example of, um, we're still going to use Cape Coast, Ghana National and Holy Child. Holy Child do not have that much land, or Abote do not have that much land, but National has a bit of land. So National can grow 10 acres, 5 acres of maize. Kwaboke, um, Fantipim, or um, Holy Child will now do um, battery cage, pottery, layers. So let's say Holy Child does 2,000 layer capacity. The 2,000 layer capacity, that means that we are at, let's say we are producing approximately at 90% or 80% capacity, you are going to be making roughly between 1,700 to 1,800 X every day. Every day. Every day. See, when the animals start to lay, they lay every blessed day. So we are feeding these schools. So Lashna does the maize. They will use the maize to exchange because you need the maize to actually feed um the beds the pottery beds so that they will give you the eggs so national will do the maize holy child does um eggs without exchange eggs and maize in fact those who are using the maize they can use it for their cocoa there's the porridge they will use it for tom brown they will use it for banku you would have reduced the amount that would have spent on this free SHS or the school feeding program so the kids themselves are also learning this. So before you even jump into, you know, when we finish SS or even GSS, there was always that break mm -hmm. period. We put these energies into agriculture before they even enter into university. It will interest them now. It will interest you to know that some of them will voluntarily want to go into agriculture because they've seen that there's markets. They've practiced it a little bit from school. And when they get to university, instead of going to read, um, no hospitality. There's this course that they, they read a lot. Banking and finance. When banks are already being, when banks are everything, most of the banking and financial institutions are now being going online. Whose bank are you coming to manage? But for food, it is a growing need that they So some of these kids, some of these youth who go into agriculture voluntarily and happily because they are earning, they earn something after DSS. They got about two and a half years or three years on campus learning how to grow chicken. It doesn't take, I mean, it doesn't take much to learn how to grow eggs now. So learn how to grow chicken. You learn how to do maize. You learn how to do vegetables. The basic vegetables that we use, pepper, tomato, onion, these three, every household use it in Ghana. Then before you add up the carrot and coke and the cabbage, so they will know options and areas, other options and areas that they will use. And so on, we will now get them to now grow their minds to now let's grow commercially because we will now be able to satisfy ourselves within our school environment, mm -hmm. within our home environment. And now we'll now say, okay, how do we now grow commercially? See, mm -hmm. some of these countries, uh, an example is Israel. Israel gave us, um, when I say gave us, he gave the world um, what we call drip irrigation. Drip irrigation is the irrigation that drops by the distance. Co, 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 mm -hmm. co. Mm -hmm. It's Israel that invented it. Why? They don't have much water. Israel needs to grind stone to get sand before they can grow. So they gave us that one. 
but still did. Israel, in one of the conversations that we had with, uh, I think the, one of the Israeli ambassadors had food storage that can last them for the next 15 years. And we say that for any, any African country, that five years. An example is what COVID came. What happened? Mm -hmm. we, were, we, we were fighting for food. Fast forward COVID. Ukraine goes to war. The whole of Africa now becomes, bread now becomes expensive because Ukraine is the world power for wheat and they grow a lot of wheat. So what else stop us? That meanwhile, this same flour that is done, we use cassava. So on our Cape Coast and Crow Road, you see this company, Casa, Casa de Europa. Europa. It's potato that they've used to do the pizza and all those ones. The bread. It means that we can grow it at our own backyard without relying on Europe or without relying. And funny enough, these guys have only one seed to grow. You know that going to me actually when it's snowing in winter. They can't grow it. It's nothing growth yet. They can be able to grow and store for the next five, ten years. What then happens to us? Mm -hmm. So policies, policies, policies. Yes. Yeah. It takes that leadership. Exactly it, it takes leadership to drive the conversation. Because other than that, you private sector will do, but they only can do to a certain point. When a private sector person find out that guys, if I tell you, I'm not making too much money. Let me use my money to go and do something else. They will use the money to go and import um, used cars and used clothes to come and sell. So policies one. Then from policies, leadership will have to start our mind to homegrown solutions. What do I mean homegrown solutions? You know that within Cape Coast and its environs, within the coastal belt, we don't have much land. So then what then do we do? We now need to now grow policies that are going to livestock, fish farming, so that fish farm can now... You, we don't need to always wait to go into the ocean to go and fish. We have a lot of water bodies. There's good boho water. Grow um, fishes from polytanks and other fish pond and co. Snail farming, everybody can start. But if there was no markets for snail, and let me say I'm an SDA person, I don't take snail. What then happens? But if there's markets, somebody will grow the snail, supply it to the packet, use it, you know that he has getting money. He can use that money to now go and buy his, his, um, his other needs. Make homegrown policies that meet your people's need. The next thing is, also, the issue of always relying on the Western powers for our everything. Because one, America will tell you, or one of the Western, some of the Western countries will tell you, don't grow grains, but grow cashew. Why? Cashew is not growing in their place. So you grow cashew, they will now, you grow cashew, you grow cocoa, uh, you grow pineapples, and they will now be in the position to control those prices. And then they will come and sell the grains to you. So we know we are eating a lot of rice. What stops us from making water region the rice hub of Ghana? Because see, water region alone has a lot of land that can grow rice feed the whole of Ghana without us importing one grain of rice. Western, part of Western, do rice cultivation. Part of Central, my Australian area there, you grow rice. So rice alone, we can be self-sufficient on rice, on um, rice, maize. But funny enough, this year we imported maize as a country. So those are the things. And then the Equa sub -region. So that's see, that brings me to what we call the after. The whole after, just last week, oh, last week, yeah. No, today is Monday, yeah. So just last week, Tuesday, I was in Poland. And had a conversation. I visited a, a, a factory um, which is into agri mechanization. And part of the thing I saw, Poland, the Poland country, Polish, lost two billion youth to Europe when, especially UK, when UK opened their borders in mm -hmm. two thousand two, no, two thousand three, two thousand and four. They about yeah, two thousand four. They about when they opened up, they jacked. I mean, proper <laughs> jacked two million. Now, these are people that would have been the perfect fresh energy. They all went into the UK and all these places, did minimal jobs and co. But the majority of them have returned. Poland has now evolved to become an agricultural powerhouse. Mm -hmm. A ton of things that I saw in Poland just last week shocked me. It is because that country has realized the need for them to grow into their um, their strong need, which is agriculture. So, and I'm bringing it to the same EU. EU has a specific stand standard. So based on one of our conversations, the lady was like, they are growing things and they are sometimes even not accepting it on the international market. Mm -hmm. This is Poland. Germany or Holland is not accepting it quick. 
Holland and Germany share border. Mm-hmm. Then you are thinking of growing um, cucumber from Asia somewhere <laughs> in, and then bringing it over here. So take advantage. We have to take advantage of the aftermarket that we have, mm-hmm. and then harness on aftermarket because we eat gari in Ghana. Nigeria is the same guy. Mm-hmm. Ghana and Nigeria have the same standards, not too much of a difference. Train our farmers and our youth to say, you know what? Nigeria has 230 million population. They can never finish satisfying the need for Gary. So we grow our cassava, process it into Gary, package it nicely in eight hours or less maximum because of, and sometimes this is where the headache is, border control. You and I have done, you've done trips on our route before. Yeah, a flower border will trip you, but the moment you jump into that Togo side, voila, that's small. Like, but so, those are some of the things that we've not. Africa country, Africa, um, president and nations need to realize that see, this is what we have as a people, this is our continent, our goods are the same everywhere. Let us, it's just slight modification. See, Sembo in Nigeria is Banku in Ghana. Mm-hmm. Fufu is fufu. Jollof is the same jollof. Um, there's a way they even this guy is called Semo or Banku in, um, in Benin. It's the same mm-hmm. like our own. So in short, we are the same. So we have the bigger markets that we need to just trade among ourselves. Mm-hmm. So marketing of our products now becomes another headache. So government should make sure that we channel most of our energies into marketing our own agricultural products. That will make sure that we are making it interesting for people. We are making the products are available. Well, another area that is hugely, hugely much of a headache is the supply chain. Tomatoes will come very soon, or uh, if it's not even started coming in Ghana, bumper harvest. The tomatoes in this year, you will see that forty percent to sixty percent of the tomatoes that will come to market will rot. And so, then what do we do? If I harvest my basket of tomatoes and I come to the market and 70%, uh, 30% is rot- rotten, I'm going to just add on those 30 and sell it as if I brought 100. There's no way you expect the, the market woman to now reduce her. Day. I'm only going to sell a portion and will not calculate the ones that is ma- that, that is bought. Yeah. So those are our things. We don't have the proper infrastructure for agriculture. What do I mean? Good roads connecting the various villages doing what we call agri-hub. The agri-hub are where satellite communities that you have the warehouse and that we can put the things, store them, or even do the first line of processing. These guys here can keep tomatoes. And when you buy tomatoes from the market, you see the quality of tomatoes that you are, you are, you are getting. You can never compare those tomatoes to our own. It's seed. We don't do enough research to even know the right seed that is meant for our soil. It will be able to add the Anybody sells anything for us, then we are okay. Mm. So are some are so are so are the bottlenecks. And those are the part the way we can bring ourselves out. Beautiful. Um let me let me you've really spoken a lot and I've really learned a lot about agriculture and everything. So looking at now I am looking at how Africans can work together. We have the Africans, we are home, we are doing what we have to do. But I also know that you know that we have our brothers and sisters in the diaspora. Uh, A lot of them do come out and say, we have allowed other people to come into Africa to take our resources. Now, you as an expert in agriculture, what are some of the investment ideas do you think we are only looking at Africans working together? Yeah. What do you think are some of the investment ideas or partnership that we can have with our brothers and sisters from the diaspora who would want to move to the motherland? A lot of them want to move. And I'll be very honest with you. Anybody who goes through me to buy a land will say, hey, Echo, I want two or three plots so that I can use one for farming. They are very much particular about agriculture, sustainability. They want to grow what they eat and everything. How can Africans join African diasporas in terms of uh, networking uh, uh, um, um, partnership and then uh, investment to to grow agriculture in Africa? 
Because this, this is this is an area that I think we need to do a lot ourselves. We need to showcase what is possible on the continent, on the motherland, and equally also for our brothers and sisters on the other side of the diaspora to also believe in what Africa has. Let them start. Let us start believing in it even right from wherever there they are. You go to the shop, buy made in Africa, buy Africa made. So that is actually what brought us to even create this platform by AfricaMade.com. Yeah. What do I say? How do I say so? You drink Starbucks coffee. What takes us from me as brothers to come together in, say, Toronto or in New York or in Las Vegas to set up our own coffee shop, bring the coffee beans from Ghana, bring the coffee beans from Kenya, and then have our own coffee shop or have a small coffee shop right from the motherland and then create our own brand mm -hmm. share butter it's down see one of the key things that COVID brought us is realizing that oh well africa has something to offer yeah until before COVID, people would not even believe in, in our organic products but now because of COVID, people have now seen that oh you can get authentic ginger viscous mm -hmm. and all these things from the motherland so let us start cultivating the habit of taking buying products that are coming from the motherland so get a chocolate don't look at the chocolate that is coming from switzerland because switzerland has not even one single cocoa tree mm. but they have how many thousands of shops and they and factories that are doing chocolate they call it crafty chocolate and coal so when you are go when you go to any place that you are buying as an African, as a as as a black person, let me just even be specific, black and people of black descent, make it a conscious effort that I want to buy something that is coming from Kenya. I can get pure coffee from Kenya. I can get pure cocoa products, chocolate products from Ghana. I can get good leather shoe coming from Nigeria. I can get authentic shea butter that is coming from other Tanzania or Benin. Mm -hmm. That is one area. Second has to do with investing on the continent. Yeah. Any how that is possible, start investing small. You touch the waters by investing in small products and small things, small projects. So you buy one plot of land or invest in the youth. This day there are so many good youth who are doing some awesome projects in Ghana, not just Ghana, across Africa. Mm -hmm. But because of technology, you can monitor them. Some of these youth are not just looking for fund. They are looking for guidance. They are looking yeah. for expertise. Probably it will be good. Somebody, one of our, most of our brothers are good in product packaging. Yeah. That's the next stage. How do we? I've seen that this product A don't want to show any brand. Actually, let me just use this flask. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. product A can be packaged to meet our standard in America. Mm -hmm. I know where they can do it. What stopped us from now partnering with people who to get this thing done? Another area that has to do with that we can actually bring this product in bulk. Say shea butter, we we'll bring it in bulk over in um, say states in the United States, and then we. We'll it to meet the the requirements because mm -hmm. you know the you know what your packets need. In terms of investing on the continent, there are so many small, medium, and large scale products. When yeah. most of our brothers speak about, we have sat down for Chinese, especially mm -hmm. they use Chinese a lot to take over our our products. I ask myself, what have you done yourself? Mm -hmm. Have you taken opportunity to visit any of the countries? You probably have done holidays in. You've done holidays in. Um, they've done holidays in Thailand, Bali, mm -hmm. or done holidays in Singapore or Malaysia. How many of them have realized that you no? Know, I need to actually go where I'm more accepted or I can blend in easily. Yeah. So do holiday. I'm not saying do holidays in Ghana. In fact, try Nigeria. It's lovely. Try Kenya. Try Benin. Every coast, you come to realize that okay, huh? I don't like what I saw, but I know something that I can do about it. Can I even offer sort of mentorship 
mm -hmm. to young businesses that are coming up. So we started that way by volunteering to say you want to mentor businesses. You will learn the various processes, the challenges they are going through. Most of our brothers and sisters out there are doing corporate and blue color jobs, which means they have actually built experience from the corporate industries. Yes. Some of owning their businesses. So they can hand hold some of these startups that are coming and guide them on packaging, guide them on labeling, guide them on marketing, guide them even digital skills. By so doing, you are gradually warming yourself into Africa, right. onto the borderland. You are learning the process of what is needed. How can I contribute to my quota? You and your friends and your team, your, your friends and guys can come together and say, every year or every other year, we want to pick a business in Africa and help. In those business, we get equity in that business. So let's say you put in you put in a contribution of let's say five K each. Mm -hmm. Ten people is fifty thousand. That fifty thousand dollars can support a business from ground zero to the next raise that they can actually go to market to raise big money. And because we you probably would have had some good mentorship or the background it guides you mm -hmm. i can say that for experience because yeah my, my, our first company another company trotter tractor came out of a cosmos innovation center program and that program the whole seed money and seed capital for that event was fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars and that's fifty thousand dollars is what we use to build business to now expand to about six other countries Kenya, wow. yeah, we did we did it in Zimbabwe, Zambia, Togo, and um, Togo and Beni were partnership, and then um, Nigeria, and it was what now moved me from Protro to now Made Africa and Buy Africa Made. It was fifty thousand dollar seed fund and incubation center. The help that helped us guide us because we had access to mentors, we had access to people that have done it and they failed, and you work in there. They guide you so that you don't fail. So right. these are some of the areas that our brothers can get into. It is not always the big projects that you're looking to oh, start a film studio or you want to start a film village before you can contribute. No way. There are mm -hmm. so many. So just don't come in and just come. You are coming for holidays. But also have an open mind to see. Within that holidays, I'm coming. December, next month, we are doing December in Ghana. Yeah. <laughs> Most of our brothers won't come in. Sometimes, actually, they're looking at, oh, wow, this place is okay. I feel home. What can I do to help? Mm -hmm. It is also for us and our various governments to also package something nicely that is not um, looking for $10 million investments and co, but small tickets where people yeah. feel like. Yeah. Because you start small. You need to test the waters before. I would not advise anybody that has not um, learned or know the area to now bring in a 500,000, uh, 500, half a million dollar investment, or even 100,000 investment to in. You now start small, that's the what that's, you get a land, that's those who are willing to move and move. Ghana and Africa is always home. It's better you invest in Africa than the Chinese coming to take it. Mm -hmm. Another issue that I also think we are facing is the mindset of the individual is made up to think that this water bottle that I'm drinking, it's more safe when it is coming from outside. True. I so, go to Malcolm and uh -huh. I see uh, rice made in Ghana with, with our local names like Abena, uh, Kweku, and all those. But we would choose to, you know, look elsewhere and get the, the Cindy and those kind of things. Echo, it's not here. Mm -hmm. We've been wired. And, 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 and that also stays goes to some of the things that our brothers can, can our brothers and sisters in the diaspora can help us do. We've been wired for a long time to think that everything black is not good. Everything, everything home, everything is coming from our home is not good. So they said even in the world, a prophet is not accepted as no home. You mentioned this, you mentioned this thing. This is a bottle of vitamin C, right? Mm -hmm. Caps that comes in. We will not drink the orange, which orange and carrot give us the vitamin C, but we will prefer to go and buy vitamin C tablet that is mixed with chemicals. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, an orange, a set of orange, 
will not cost us up to five cities. How in the hell would we do? Which is less than what? Less than 50 cents. Less than 20 cents. We will not. We will prefer to go and buy. So we've been wired to think that everything home is not good. Mm -hmm. So we always need to look outside. Meanwhile, the solutions are right by us. An example is our herbal medicines. For some time now, Echo, I have not been doing, I don't do malaria drugs, I have diabetes and co. I'm not doing any advert for anybody. Yeah. But yeah. those bitters and those herbal mixtures works better for me. And anytime that they have a sense of malaria, I test and I'll now go and take those medicines. It helps. Mm -hmm. Our herbal medicines, we don't, let me give one last example. We were told that um, charcoal, you know why mm -hmm. we're kids? We used to use charcoal. And then uh, the uh, stock of plantain, the stock of plantain, uh, plantain, plantain stock plantain, yeah. to brush our teeth. They said it's not good, right? This told they we were told that it's only you need to do paste, toothpaste. Now almost every toothpaste is going in black. Yeah, charcoal. they will tell me charcoal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> almost every commercial soap company is now being black soap now. Meanwhile, I'm wanting. Those days, I like a seminar. Oh, that's not the seminar. Good. Yeah. If you if you even use it to bath, they will laugh at you. But now, people are realizing that come on, hold on, there is something that is missing here, and they are going to it. So we've been wired to think that everything that is and this is it. This was pure capitalism and nothing else. This might be very controversial, but let me say just say it. We they banned hemp and then introduced cotton. The advantages of hemp and cotton is like this. It's wide apart. Cotton does not, uh, cotton, you need chemicals and all those ones. I'm giving you in the farming sense. Yeah. But hemp has its own natural thing that it fixes into the soil, property that fixes into the soil. But we demand it and now, without taking how many years before people, and even that one, I think one day we need to do a special, a special mm -hmm. recording on that one. That one, yeah, our yeah. government are not opening their eyes to it. I was so blown away in one cannabis expo I went in South Africa two years ago, two, three years ago. The guys, the, those guys and those people coming from Canada and Costa Rica, you are from Ghana, you guys have the, have the biggest THC. Yeah. You guys have the highest THC. Yet, we are, we are waiting for the whole world to catch up to do it before we catch up when the market has is been saturated and collapsed. Bro, I went to South Africa twice. And you know, we we, we if 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 you know you know you know we deal with herbs, you know, yes, nature. Sir. We we will not lie about it. I ah. mean, and even here, you walk around and then you see cannabis store, cannabis dispensary, cannabis this people go there, it's legal. You see, to me, I think that the Ghana government only thinks that the youth or the people only smoke the herb for just smoking the herb for herb for smoking sake. It is all here. Yeah, we will talk about this later. But hey, <laughs> I really want to appreciate you for coming on my channel. I always want to do it within one hour so that people can watch, comment, and share. Now, within two minutes, tell us exactly what you are doing. What is your project about? Right. Well, thank you so much um, for having me. Um, we have a lot to do for Africa and for the world and the black race, so we'll keep pushing. Um, currently, we are out with what is called buyafricamade.com. It's um, a multi-vendor e-commerce platform for everything made in Africa. The whole idea is to make sure that we bring in authentic African products, or authentic made in Africa products onto the forefront. Why do I say that? Um, you go to Kenya, my Kenyan friends are asking me, oh, you didn't bring me Shabata from Ghana. You are in South Africa and my South African and the Bible friends are asking me, oh, you didn't bring me any West African fabrics. You turn around and come to the other side. Um, back home when they are coming, they say, ah, you, did, you went to Kenya and you didn't bring me coffee. You didn't bring me tea. So we decided to now create a platform that will enable Africans to trade among ourselves and also across. So we built www.buyafricanmade.com. It's a multi-vendor e-commerce platform that SMEs, small, medium scale enterprises, put on their products on there. You can actually purchase. We've um, had 
logistic platform backed it so that you can actually buy and would supply or send it straight to your homes. And payment is seamless and very secured. Um, we have also built what we call Secure and um, Source Africa. So Source Africa is on Buy Africa Made platform for companies who want to source in bulk to redistribute or to work on their own. So that is what we are currently working on. And I'm around Europe looking at how, see, funny enough, you go to most of our these shops in Europe and the African shop is Europe. Funny enough, it's being run by a non-African. Mm -hmm. Most of our African shops in Europe, Afro shops, and so this one, we brought this to the forefront where you can get authentic African-made products um, right at your doorsteps. And we encourage we encourage our brothers in the diaspora to key into it. You get from share butter to everything. We are equally open for partnerships and collaborations across the board. Thank you so much, Joko. All right. Thank you very much. So thank you all for watching this video. Uh, I've already told you my platform is now open to anyone who has something to share with Africans coming together and then learning more. So until then, I'll come here again with another awesome, beautiful interview.